Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Liang Ming, uh, Managing Director for Bits and Watts. And um, today we have a special guest, and uh, Dr. Yang's uh, Mandarin from New. And uh, uh, you know, I think this is probably the second time or maybe the first time we do the in-person uh, smart grid seminar with a lot of folks uh, uh, virtual and uh, it's a hybrid mode. Let me do a quick introduction of uh, Dr. Yang's uh, Mandarin. And uh, he is executive director for Neum Energy. Neum, uh, some of you may know that is a new city to be built between the border of Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, will have 100% powered by renewable energy. And uh, Yang served as a, you know, before this position, Yang served as a, a chief financial officer at RWE Group and uh, chief financial and the commercial officer at Re Re Reactive Technologies. Yang holds a PhD and a master degree in business administration from University Munster uh, in Germany. So let's welcome Yang to share with us the vision of designing a 100% renewable energy system. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Liang. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here with you today at Stanford University's uh, Smart uh, Grid Seminar, a place where leading minds come together uh, to discuss issues of greatest significance. And um, I would most certainly encounter the ambition uh, and absolute necessity to not just talk but take material action on climate change and to thrive to a carbon neutral world as one of the greatest challenges of our times. So last week, um, I was at COP26 in Glasgow where nations around the world gathered to take further action on the goals of the um, Paris Agreement um, and the uh, UN Framework Convention of uh, Climate Change. So there have been uh, many pledges made by countries throughout the uh, COP26 and uh, with, uh, let's say, at least somewhat, somewhat promising commitment to phase out of coal in richer countries by 2040 and by uh, poorer countries in 2050, keeping the hope uh, of staying within the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase of global temperatures alive. Um, also, Saudi Arabia's uh, net zero carbon pledge was seen as a significant step into the right direction for a country whose GDP, let's don't forget that, by the vast majority, so 85, 90% is based on income from hydrocarbons. And um, within Saudi Arabia, NEOM is the lighthouse of this journey to a net zero carbon position. So I must admit, I'm truly excited to share with you today's topic, which is delivering and designing a 100% renewable energy system from scratch. So um, ladies and gentlemen, what is NEOM? NEOM is a, an economic free zone. Uh, think about a country within a country with its own laws and regulation in the northwestern part of Saudi Arabia, um, next to the Red Sea. Um, it has, um, got it, here we go. So um, it has the, the, the size of um, about mid-sized European countries like Belgium or Austria, and is being built up from, from ground uh, zero as a living laboratory. It is the largest clean infrastructure project worldwide with a total capital expenditure north of 500 billion US dollars, um, being key to reduce Saudi Arabia's dependence on oil and to diversify its economy. Um, particular for this background here though, on this seminar, it is also a hub for innovation for entrepreneurs, business leaders, and companies who will come to NEOM to research and incubate and commercialize clean tech innovation. So for me, ultimately though, NEOM is a bold dream. It's a, it's a vision of what the new future of urban development may look like. In fact, NEOM means new future. It's an accelerator for change and human progress. 
So really, NEOM is a fantastic opportunity to build an innovative carbon-free ecosystem from scratch. And this is the reason why I joined NEOM a couple of years ago. So I would say um, an image tells more than a thousand words. So let me just share with you a video to give you some more impressions from NEOM. The future of energy is not about innovation. It's about transforming our relationship to energy. It's about imagining a world which is based on 100% renewable energy. And if you can dream it, tomorrow is about fully embracing nature's everlasting hidden treasures sun, dirt, and wind. That's where it all starts in the earth. Every inch of land counts. No matter how rough for human living, each corner holds invaluable secrets. Here, where the wind may seem abundant, lies the very place where we will produce the cheapest and cleanest energy on Earth. Neo has unrivaled solar and wind resources to unlock clean and low-cost energy to leverage key sectors such as water, food, transport, and manufacturing. All combined to drive accelerated soft sustainable human progress, even in our intensive industries like prime processing. So this gives you um, a, a bit of an impression and a feel for um, how, it, how it looks like in NEOM. But let me come now uh, first to the uh, four strategic pillows, I guess, we have um, within NEOM Energy. Uh, first and foremost, it's obviously the designing of a 100% carbon-free energy system uh, at lowest cost uh, in a very secure way. Um, that stands, I guess, at its heart. Um, Next to um, a leading integrated customer experience, uh, we will build clean energy intensive industries, for example, a game changing 2000 megawatt green hydrogen plant, which has been announced already a good year ago, as well as um, our hyperscale data center partnership, which Oracle, which uh, came out, I guess, more recently. Um, last but not least, though, um, it's the uh, element to create a leading energy innovation ecosystem as a perfect environment and a center for successful commercialization of groundbreaking technologies. Um, you will see that um, later on as well in the presentation, um, without innovation, NEOM will not cut it towards 100% renewable-based energy. So it's not a nice to have, but a conditio sine qua non, and super crucial to deliver uh, lowest cost levels in a secure form on a 100% renewable basis. Um, when it comes to um, NEOM's um, unrivaled, I would say, solar and, and, uh, and wind profiles, I think this slide gives you a bit of an, an overview. So on the top left, you'll see um, basically wind speeds across the world the darker it gets, the more interesting it gets from a, from a pure wind capacity perspective. And at the, bottom, um, at the bottom left, you'll see the same for solar. So um, ladies and gentlemen, I guess the trick here is not to be good in one of them, but having both at the same time. Because uh, obviously you, you want to satisfy both uh, peak as well as um, off peak loads. And uh, NEOM is one of the very few sites worldwide which can offer um, a very a complementary uh, uh, profile between wind and solar. So just to give you an idea, um, wind capacity factors, and we're talking onshore here, 
are above 40%. In some areas in NIOM, uh, these are typically capacity factors which you hit if you're sort of lucky uh, on an offshore sites. Um, with regard to solar capacity factors, we're talking low 30s. Again, um, given the high radiation in, in Saudi Arabia, in particular NEOM, we are, we are blessed with these uh, natural gifts. And they form, uh, I would say, the backbone of the plan to come up with a 100% renewable system. Now, NEOM needs to define an energy market structure as well as a regulatory framework enabling us to achieve NEOM's 2030 vision. So, and this I'll try to uh, summarize here on this slide, which is, I have to admit, uh, uh, deeply simplified. But um, maybe as a starting point, how we, how we did it, we were looking at um, uh, estimating demand in particular for uh, residential and industrial customers by 2030, based on all the uh, expectations and estimations done by different sectors. Uh, to be able to then model the optimal supply to it, um, not just from an amount, but also from an, a mix and from a timing perspective, obviously to keep uh, supply and demand in somewhat balance over time. Um, this triggered several no regret moves in particular with regard to pre-development of sites. So um, as demand, for example, can start a little bit quicker to pull up, you just are not able to react as quickly with, uh, you know, okay, we'll need another five gigawatts of solar more. Um, can you deliver please in two years? Uh, that doesn't work. So the trick here really is to create strategic optionality in terms of doing your homework up front and then being able to accelerate if material deviations happen. Um, the benefit which we also have is that um, um, we can use obviously the the wider region in this sense as a um, as a, a as, as a spillover basin, let's say for um, for solar uh, in particular, in case demand doesn't uh, catch up. So the question is then, what markets do we need to build in order to uh, supplement the, the pure needs for demand and uh, supply. And could it be, um, so what drives the lowest uh, cost of uh, energy? Could be wholesale markets in terms of forward markets, future markets, could be spot markets, flexibility markets, or should we just focus on primary and secondary reserves? So um, these all exist, but the core question is what drives ultimately uh, lowest LCOE, or if any, uh, the extreme may be that we go to a fully centralized approach and um, uh, drive bulk power supply through long-term PPA contracts, which could equally also be an option. Um, I guess the I've rarely been in a situation where you can discuss as freely about such fundamental difference in market setup. We literally start from scratch. Um, the market design project, as um, you'll see here, has obviously a whole bunch of interdependencies also to the technical design. Again, questions, you know, maybe we, we pull out one um, around, should we have an AC grid or a DC grid, or maybe a, an AC-DC hybrid uh, on a high voltage basis? are questions you typically don't ask yourself when you work literally in any legacy system. What it's really about is to base your decisions and uh, attach it uh, to uh, the existing to make it as complementary, as seamless as it gets. Um, we have now the chance to decide, well, uh, we could go DC, for example, which will have um, pretty dramatic consequences with regard to frequency management, for example, and auxiliary services. And in that sense, uh, um, a pretty um, important feedback loop again to market design questions. So um, if you think this is kind of a one-way flow here, that is really not how the market design project works. 
it is um, designed in terms of um, several iterations where we're trying to step by step guide us directionally towards um, the best outcomes. Um, with regard to um, the sustainability, uh, sustainability of the underlying market design, it is the goal to deliver sustainable business models. Um, that's actually at the core. So, and this is, uh, applies for uh, the entirety of the value chain. So generation, transmission, distribution, and, and retail. Um, in order to achieve that, I guess, um, taking different perspectives uh, and looking at the same thing is quite important. So for example, if you think about financing, um, would uh, financiers be happy to take investments in asset classes in Yom? Um, and at what time? And uh, for example, at what risk premium? So um, why risk premium? Isn't, isn't there a standardized kind of um, price per, per capex for wind and solar farms? Yes, there is, but maybe not in a system where the regulatory environment is about to change from uh, Saudi Arabian regulation towards its own regulation without having any guidance whatsoever yet how that regulation will look like. So um, you can even try to adjust for that in your underlying contracts, but the question is how much does that trigger and counter our core objective of lowest levelized cost of energy. Um, does it fulfill requirements for consumers? Expectations. Um, so retail energy thinking maybe about way beyond the, the, the pure traditional model of energy retailing and thinking more about um, a service and data platform which enables amongst others also power supply but numerous other services which could be delivered. Um, would a target market design, for example, send uh, appropriate price signals to industrial customers um, to optimize their production loads? Now, this is for us super important. Why? Because in the market where, in a let's say more traditional markets, um, you had a lot of the flexibility management by nat nature sitting on the generation leg. Yeah? Um, you could adjust coal plants, in particular gas-fired power stations, reasonably well and flexibly. Um, in a world where you're sitting with wind and solar, um, determining what exactly the output is for wind and solar is, is pretty tricky, not to say sort of impossible, okay? You will directionally get it right, but that's it. So the, uh, you'll, but still need, you still need to have the flexibility. So it needs to come from somewhere, which is typically either from the demand. So there's a new expectation on demand, or you add additional uh, investments into the system in form of different type of storages. So we'll come to this later, but um, a, a key feature is also the, the digital energy platform and the respective energy operating system, um, which you'll see in the, in the more bottom part of it. So this project is underway um, and it's our goal to come up with an integrated high level market design, let's say by mid 2022, where we understand um, um, roughly where we are, where do we want to go directionally, and what's the transition between A and B? Um, I know this sounds dramatically uh, simple. Trust me, it, it, it isn't quite. And um, the year afterwards, I would say, so from mid 2022 to 23, we'll develop a very detailed market design for the respective segments with um, um, respective business models for the parts of the energy value chain. Um, to then start implementing the year after that. So in parallel, um, we're having a work stream on the regulatory framework, uh, which I haven't shown here, but in, uh, this is for me, let's say a true novum, uh, as usually uh, fundamental redesign questions are often cut short due to the, let's call it inertia of existing uh, regulatory systems. 
Here we have the unique chance to do it the other way around, ultimately create a, a system around renewable markets and uh, which make sense in themselves and then find the respective regulation for it to govern it, but equally support and challenge it, right? And incentivize investments within these markets. And that's, that's pretty, pretty core. So I thought, why should I carry all these kind of um, difficult questions with me uh, around and not share some of them with you? But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's always when I've been asked, um, how does that feel to kind of be part of this project? It's 95% it's, uh, pure excitement and pleasure. And 5%, I would say, somewhat daunting. OK, and the daunting element, I guess, is that you have numerous questions which, you know, you need to raise and deal with, but you simply don't have an answer yet on. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, trust me, that's the better of the two, with the other being all the questions you don't even know yet, which you still need to answer. So let's just pick out a few here. So. Um, I mean, uh, I won't go into detail around how a dispatch of generation assets work, right? But typically you have a, a merit order according to uh, marginal cost of your power station, um, which ultimately um, decides then on your, on your dispatch and how plants are being used. Um, this works if you have a diversity in your generation mix. This is sort of... <laughs> hard if your fuel costs are zero or close to zero because your curve is pretty flat. So leaves you with the question, how are you going to dispatch? What's your mechanism by which you're going to do that, right? Um, take, let's say, another one around uh, retail, OK? Um, on the retail side, um, typically, and you know, having um, worked for many, many years in the, in the UK and in, in Europe, that's the seen as the market which introduced a competition on the retail side by far the earliest and the uh, uh, ruthlessness in the sense of 100% uh, um, opening off of the retail market, um, hoping that competition will drive um, prices down will drive innovation, etc. So nothing wrong with that, and a lot of it happened. Okay, but if I look at the development over the totality of twenty years in the UK um, retail market, I'm not so sure if that has been uh, an ideal outcome. Let's say, okay, and I, I may say so as I've been party to it for very many years. So um, the question is allowed. Is it really sensible to maybe have competition? And if so, on what basis? Um, may not go down very well in terms of um, trusting the regulator to enforce low tariffs. Um, but assuming um, a respective regulation could happen in this way, I would say cost of the total cost of system could be kept down. Now, you can only, uh, I think, very well assume that we've had very heated discussions on these, on these matters, uh, as well as on, on regulation, for example, right? We wanted to tackle regulation ahead of time uh, to kind of avoid some of the difficulties I mentioned earlier. So, um, and what then happens is typically you draw from experience, which draws you back into the past, which then acknowledges that you don't base the regulation on elements which are really um, design steps for the future. In short, um, a first cut of an attempt didn't include, for example, anything around data uh, regulation whatsoever. But taken for now as an hypothesis that a, a digital energy platform will be at the core of what we're doing. I personally would assume that probably 30 to 50% of future energy regulation in 100% renewable based environment will be based on data. So, um, and this sort of blindness or shortnessness 
you constantly need to remind yourself deep knowledge helps as long as you can cut out the bias to fall back into i know it all because i've seen it it's a it's a partially let's say a very mm, unhelpful capacity you may carry within yourself okay so um here are a few words on on innovation and uh, how i see uh, some of the industries having used technologies in different ways so um, please uh, take this as an upfront apology if, if you guys are potentially car experts and falling in love with it so i i could have used other industries as well but from my perception okay technology has been used as a tool in particular to drive efficiencies up or customer satisfaction now ladies and gentlemen there's nothing wrong with that um you know to spend you know have a, a more fuel efficient engine or have more comfort in your car um it is no problem but there is a choice you need to make do you utilize do you utilize uh, technology as a tool for efficiency, or should I say misuse it only, or as a tool for effectiveness, i.e. doing the right things? So, and if you turn this a little bit further and say, okay, I don't wanna use it only as a tool for efficiency, but change it at the core, how would then, the automobile industry look more like. And this could then look something like this, okay? So that I, I know this sort of, yeah, it's, it's just um, trying to get the point across that you need to start at the core with changing your assumptions, okay? Everything what you saw before shows technology progress, but in the end, you're driving a car with a diesel engine. Okay, and um, this is what I would say um, is a different view on the same thing, but the fundamental use case for technology just goes very much, very much deeper. And um, the same thing happens in the energy industry, I guess. So we are working of legacy systems and um, we put digital layers on top and provide let's call it marginal improvements. Again, marginal, not disrespectfully, they're all needed. Actually, I, I love most of them, but they are marginal to the core. So for example, improved demand forecasting or I don't know, predictive maintenance or you know, um, other elements. Um, Neom's digital uh, platform um, will be though built, Neom's energy system, I beg your pardon, will be built around a digital core. So we turn it literally upside down. And without these uh, digital technologies, it is our firm belief that we will not be able to build this energy system from scratch. So all parts of the value chain, let it be generation or transmission, distribution or retail will be connected as an integrated data layer to enable decision-making on a consolidated basis from a total system optimization to ultimately enable a 100% renewable based system. Okay, so um, I thought let's bring some of these things to life and pick one, one example, let's say around frequency management, where I'm sure you, you guys are, are all experts on already. So um, what you see here is basically uh, frequency over time. And uh, the ideal scenario is obviously that the frequency ideally stays constant. So I guess in some countries that's 60 Hertz, uh, in, in others it's 50 Hertz, doesn't really matter as long as it stays constant, i.e. supply and demand are identical in, to every point in time, okay? Um, sadly, that's never the case, okay? Also not in conventional systems. Um, and what you then have is uh, typically um, three areas, right? One is a dynamic uh, response, which is running to kind of management and support the system. And then, you know, if you have a, a power failure, um, 
next steps kick in on primary and secondary reserve. And the only difference is really that primary reserve kicks in out in milliseconds, let's say within up to 30 seconds or a minute, depending on which regulatory regime you're looking at. And then secondary reserves mechanisms kicks in. So um, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is if there is anything uh, great on conventional power systems from my perspective of this presentation it's it's two things right well, one is you have as a free good let's say uh, system inherent inertia as it is produced let's say as a byproduct due to spinning masses so for example i don't know if a, if you have a power failure on your ccgt and it stops the turbine doesn't stop immediately, it still swings, it's a spinning mass. And this um, spinning mass creates stability for the grid uh, to be able to react. It creates stability for frequency management, okay? It buys you time, it buys you time to act. The other uh, benefit is obviously that gas and coal-fired power stations can be run to uh, achieve exact uh, power outputs. Okay, so they can you can use some of them depending if they fulfill the requirements of flexibility already in use for a primary particular secondary reserve. Um, so that said, uh, frequency management already represents an increasing risk in many countries. Uh, sadly, also here in the U U.S. Right, so the number of blackouts in the U.S. Um, have doubled between 2015 and 2020 due to a variety of reasons, uh, ranging from extreme weather. So everyone, I guess, will remember the uh, sort of disaster in, in Texas in 21, earlier this year, uh, as well as equipment failures. So, um, and even, uh, and, and this was even prior to the increase of really material renewables, okay, um, in the system, which is now gonna come, I guess, on the back of the new infrastructure bill passed on on November 9th this year. So um, just in case you guys think this, this challenge isn't big enough, a 100% renewable-based system, let's say, doesn't benefit from these two positives. Yes? I'm going to ask a quick question. Sure you can. But if you have a purely DC system, then you don't have frequency at all. That's right. That's right. So I'm, I'm showing here the examples for with the assumption that you have an underlying AC system. Yeah. Yep. So that's right. For a DC system, you wouldn't have that problem. You would have other challenges. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So that implies you have an uh, uh, alternating current uh, high voltage system. So um, firstly, as I mentioned before, our control over wind and solar is, is pretty tough. Um, and due to the non-existence of spinning turbine uh, and their inverter-based connection to the grid, I guess wind and solar don't produce any natural inertia. Let's say. Yeah. So, and this lack of inertia means that power failures lead to sharper drops. So, which I try to recognize here, in the in the in the steeper rock off, so the rate of change of, of frequency uh, just dropping quicker, like a stone. There is no resilience, really inherent resilience in the system to stop it. That's right. Energy storage. I think that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, but the core question really is now th th this this. This turns into a, an equally, I guess, real and true dilemma, right? So um, should we seemingly destabilize the power grid even more uh, through a, a substantial uptake of renewables, or should we just cut short our ambitions on climate change, okay? Uh, does it just become maybe too difficult to deal with it? So, and um, I believe that there are several ways to tackle the challenge of adequate frequency response in an AC system. But in all cases, in all cases, real-time data and optimization in the system is crucial. And one key technology that we'll use in NEOM is artificial intelligence as it can solve optimization problems with unprecedented speed. So, um, 
how would that look? So artificial intelligence enables, uh, from my perspective, the management of various renewable resources in real time and at scale, uh, which is both uh, super helpful and needed for NEOM. It will define the optimal dispatch of different energy assets. So as you see here, energy storage, uh, which he mentioned, demand side response, um, inputs from, from microgrids or from EV fleets, it can be a, a number of things, whilst taking into account actual and forecasted generation using weather data, for example, or actual and forecasted power demand based on, on cooling estimates, based on temperature or industrial consumption or battery status uh, with regard to their, their charging estate. The algorithm will optimize the um, system for a second by second basis on real time data. So not consumption data metered every 15 minutes. I have to say, I don't know what the what the metered data uh, timescales in in California is, but typically for residential uh, customers in Europe, you'd be looking at 15 minutes. OK, so and 15 minutes sounds from a pure technology perspective, sort of prehistorical. Yeah, it's, it's like, why do you do that? And the reason is pretty simple because the entire systems are typically based on it and a change on meters cost a heck of a lot of money. So you just don't change it, okay? Now, again, um, that's a great explanation for legacy systems. It's not such a great explanation if you can start from scratch. So the question is now on the other end, not how far can we scale it? I.e., if I get, for example, your, your data, your demand, um, let's say on 100 data points per second, would this be helpful? And I can assure you the answer is probably not, okay? So the, the real question you need to ask yourself is, what is the, the tricky point where um, you can reduce the time of response and make your demand as accurate as possible so it can create value for the overall system in terms of reducing overall LCOE. That's, that's the million dollar question. And Neom, um, that is our um, uh, aspiration, will be able to smartly steer um, millions of assets, whether it be the solar farm in Shikri or uh, uh, the wind farm in Gulf of Aqaba or uh, some of the residents' uh, freezers and fridges, yeah, to optimize ultimately the entire system and thereby enable a 100% um, renewable economy. Now, to enable real-time optimization, consumption and generation data uh, needs to be available on real-time basis. Uh, to make informed decision and established systems um, kind of don't help on that uh, because um, business models have been uh, disintegrated. Also, their data um, is, uh, data silos have been created. Let's say for each part of the of the value chain, and this makes um, cross value chain optimization. Uh, let's call it slightly challenging. Uh, because even if you wanted it to be, the, the data isn't around, okay? So um, what we are trying to achieve with our um, uh, energy platform is to have a shared and integrated data lake for the entirety of the value chain, you know, connecting operational and digital activities. And these um, consist or can consist of, of five, five different layers uh, outlined at your right, so um, uh, firstly, I would say a, a cloud layer that provides scalable solutions of, of connectivity. You have a data layer that stores, manages, and secures all data in the um, energy value chain. You have the enablement layers, um, uh, ultimately, which runs uh, analytics and intelligence, um, does real-time asset optimization, AI being one of them, but virtual reality or augmented reality tools um, can be equally applied, okay? Just as a little remarker here, okay, I've heard about this, but never in energy, right? Is this now innovation, okay? And the answer is, 
whilst copy pasting isn't allowed in school or in university, I take the prerogative to exactly do that, to exactly do that in uh, building up this energy system. Because there are already industries who are using it just because the energy industry didn't decide to do it yet because there isn't a use case doesn't necessarily mean it cannot be done. So it actually takes one of the risks away, which I carry in my bag, which I would call broadly execution risk. So don't please think that innovation needs to be some rocket science being created out of the blue. It can, can obviously be, but there are a number of areas where uh, this is by far not necessary. So um, blockchain layer in particular, then interesting, if we were to come to a marketplace where peer-to-peer -peer transactions would be relevant. Uh, so for uh, running distributed ledger capabilities, basically. And lastly, a, a marketplace layer that offers various applications and capabilities uh, to the outside world. So for example, I don't know, white labeling of selective, uh, selective uh, energy market data to companies in other sectors or enabling companies to plug into our system to provide energy services to NEON. Now, one other aspect which I think should be mentioned is that everything what I said so far is using data retrospectively. So after an event, just a little bit quicker and just a little bit more sophisticated, okay? But what if we could predict and rapidly simulate what might happen to frequency, let's say in the very near term? i.e. in the very near term, meaning in the next few seconds or in the next half minute as a sort of front warning system. Couldn't this kind of preemptive use of technology make a step change in managing renewable grids? So you cut out basically a huge chunk of the problem already before the event happens. And then with the leftovers, which will eventually happen, you'll be able to at least reactively deal with it pretty simple. So um, I would like to share with you one example, which goes a few years back, but I was personally involved in the aftermath in it, which is the, uh, the blackout in South, uh, South Australia in 2016. Yeah. So basically it resulted from a storm which damaged uh, high, voltage infra high voltage infrastructure and had a cascading failure of the entire high voltage transmission system, uh, resulting almost in the entirety of the state of South Australia being off grid, okay? And I know hindsight is a wonderful thing, but had the system operator had a front warn system on it, which would have told him at least, let's say five to 10 seconds ahead of time, 80 to 90% of the damage could have been prevented. So we can now say, okay, it's, it would have been difficult still because some of the uh, underlying infrastructure wasn't intact and we probably will never be able to prevent it completely. But from a pure materiality perspective, so the good old 80-20 approach, that would have really done the job. And um, this was a time where um, I think they would have even had a chance to, to do it without massive technology. So we're using now technology to uh, preempt. And we need to start, I guess, recognizing this potential around data technology and optimization in, the, in a wider sense to make it work in particular for, for renewable integration. Um, I appreciate though that this is easier said than done. It ultimately requires a tailor-made uh, digital energy platform, frankly, which has never been developed before. So I get often asked one question. So which is not the kind of uh, dealing with the left side of the brain, but more with the right. So how does that feel? How does that feel to run a market design project, right? Uh, like this, which um, is awfully inspiring and meaningful as a, as a lighthouse for trying to 
make it work and show the world that you can actually do turn 100% renewable systems into reality. And it's a little bit like this picture, okay? So there are areas which are, from my perspective, very clear and colored. So, and you can, uh, I feel pretty good about it. And, it, you know, all, all the testing and working we've done confirms that looks actually pretty good. You have some areas where you have a good idea, a proper working hypothesis, um, but you're not so sure you need to do more work, but at least you know the, 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 the deficits, okay? Um, but at least you know what you don't know. The, the real uncomfortable part to some extent is the part where I know I'm not even asking all the right questions because I simply don't know them. And, and how do you deal with this type of problem, okay? So, and um, ultimately the way we are going in this project is one is sort of top down from a more conceptual perspective uh, around designing markets and the, the technical grid, as I just described. The other one is a rather bottom up pragmatic perspective. So you then go and say, okay, what's already out there? What's currently already out there, which gives me um, uh, capabilities in certain elements, which I need for sure in the first place. So for example, um, the ability to dispatch, not just large, but every load at very low cost will be a feature if you know, demand flexibility is core to a renewable system. So I guess um, both of these approaches we're starting to embrace. And it, it is in the end, I can't tell you if we're gonna be successful in it or which of these one is gonna be more successful, but we just need to be realistic and uh, approaching it from, from, from both angles. So um, this ultimately leads me uh, to the end, ladies and gentlemen. So um, I would say um, maybe concluding on one final point, yeah? Um, we have a pretty good team at NEOM and uh, quite a lot of expertise, okay? Um, guys know their stuff, um, very diverse team from different areas across the globe, okay? Um, that said, we are humble enough to say, we don't know it all, and we most likely can't do it on our own either. So, and this is part of the reason why I'm actually here today and um, uh, here with, uh, uh, with he and Liang uh, to uh, also um, uh, support work uh, which, in collaboration between Stanford University and, and NIOM via the uh, joining the um, Bits and Watts pro affiliate program, which is quite important to us because um, we need not just our brains, but actually a number of more bright brains uh, also here from Stanford, actually all of yours to make it work. Because ultimately turning our vision of 100% um, uh, renewable energy system uh, doesn't and shouldn't remain a dream, but uh, we can all turn it uh, into reality uh, together. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. And uh, we have about uh, less than 10 minutes left. And we received quite a bit of interesting questions. So I will start with questions from, uh, I will combine them together, starting from questions related to energy. The first question is, uh, uh, what, you know, how do you consider hydrogen in this picture? Then uh, uh, combine another one is, uh, what's a decision use ammonium as a carrier as opposite to liquid organic hydrogen carrier? Have you considered that? What's the division or what's the thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, a couple of comments on this. So for, for me, the question is on, on hydrogen. I mean, we obviously, the 2000 megawatts I'm, I mentioned earlier is not just green hydrogen production, but it's, uh, it's then being turned into uh, green ammonia to be exported afterwards, okay? Um, so that's the whole um, plan around um, that facility. Now, within NEOM, we could obviously also use uh, green hydrogen 
for for our own purposes, right? So um, going maybe down to into my realities in neon, physically speaking, there is exactly one power station. Okay, one power station, and it's called it's the Duba Green Power Station. And slightly ironically, <laughs> I have to say, it's called Duba Green because. <laughs> one wall is painted green. It's not green. It's a gas-fired power station. Okay, so we can we can the one one thought is to turn this station into a green hydrogen-based superpeaker. Okay, so um, benefits of this would be, I obviously it it would add stability to an AC-led system. Again, I'm taking an assumption. In an AC world, this could create a lot of value and stability as it's good. It's sitting in a good location as well. Um, in a DC world, less are relevant. So let's just focus on the, the better side of it, where it is relevant on the AC side. Um, super peaker, meaning, God, we'll be using it maybe two, three, four hundred hours per year. Not very often. OK, uh, then the economics don't matter that much from a total system LCOE perspective. Okay. Um, if you look though at the conversion, what we're doing here, which is we're producing uh, renewable energy, we turn it into green hydrogen, and then we uh, pump the hydrogen through uh, pipelines into uh, the new, uh, let's say, modified super pika to then produce power again at it. And this whole circle takes away about 60 to 70 percent of the energetic value of the power in the first place. So it's not completely uh, the, the most cheapest way of doing business, let's say. Um, um, and the current pragmatic view is if we have an AC system and a, if we can make it work with regard to Super Pika, then this could be a very good use case. I cannot see it running on anywhere near base load because it would be just it would be just too expensive. There are many other ways how we could make this work. A little side challenge to that is, Please don't assume that uh, turbines exist for hydrogen either. Okay, so the the largest and probably now you know a number of asset manufacturers will say, well, it's much bigger. But my reality is maybe ten megawatt or twenty megawatt. Okay, so if you have now, as we have a six hundred sixty megawatt plant, are we putting there sixty six turbines or thirty three? Or what's the plan? So, so that asset doesn't even exist yet. Okay. So sometimes we need to be careful that these ideas need to then turn into reality. And these are the realities we are facing. As a consequence of that, we are telling now the, I don't know, GEs, Siemens, ABBs, Hitachis, Honeywells of the world, guys, please uh, embrace uh, turbine production based on hydrogen, it's going to come. And we need you to start innovating now in order to have it in a couple of years time. OK. okay. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I really like the plan and everything. But uh, when is the intended date of completion? Like When do you see this energy system become a reality? 2030 is our planning date. 2030. Um, the reality that's when the, the when we have a huge milestone, but the whole idea is that it obviously grows on there afterwards as well. But all the design questions we're doing is aiming at 2030. So let me combine, let me ask these two questions together. It's, a, it's not directly anything related, but it's a, they are excellent questions. So the system will be 100% renewables. We talked about the scope two and scope three uh, emissions, right? But uh, to construct this kind of system, the upstream, the scope three emission will be huge. And uh, how do you manage that? 
And uh, then another interesting question is regarding, you know, how do you create a labor market in that region, be able to develop and deliver this kind of huge project? Okay. So I think on the latter, this seems to be, it's from my perspective, a more manageable problem because in, in particular in the regions of the Middle East, there have been numerous giga projects been done successfully. I'm not therefore saying it's easy and straightforward and a slam dunk, but that from my perspective is a more manageable task. The other question I have to say is spot on. So here are a couple of, of guiding answers I would say. So um, one is you would in any case have a massive exposure on scopes free emissions in any case, what you're doing, okay? So, um, and, and what we have done is set up a um, carbon management framework, which ultimately, you know, follows very basic principles, right? Which is, first of all, what's my position? Like if you think you're running a trading book, okay? You think, what's my, what's my position where I'm sitting at? And then we've looked at scope one, scope two, and scope three. Whereas scope three, we've looked at the material areas of scope three, not to the nth degree of scope three, not because we don't want to go there at some point in time, but we want to cut off at least 80 to 90% of scope three right away. In this build-up phase, which you, which you mentioned earlier, we are not going to be uh, uh, carbon neutral at all. I mean, we basically need to import power currently to power up the whole system in the first place. Okay. But what we are going or intending to do is buy at least carbon certificates or generate carbon offsets for that period to neutralize our carbon footprint. Again, you may say, well, that sounds sensible. Okay, let's bring a breeze of reality into this as well. Um, where do you buy them from? You mean from the market, which doesn't exist? You mean from that market? Or where do you get them from? And then, or should I go to, I don't know, Southeast Asia and, and, and plant a, a rice farm and then generate some, some carbon certificates from that? Obviously not. It needs to be linked to your home base in some way or form. So I would call that, I mean, there are pretty clear regulation on gold standard certificates, right? But uh, in simplified terms, follow the red face test, okay? By buying cheap certificates from somewhere, do you really believe you're sticking and passing the red face test in terms of truly offsetting the carbon footprint you are producing? Um, last point, I would say it will have also very practical changes, for example, in the procurement strategy of our services. So there is some thought around, well, should we ultimately ask suppliers to offer us uh, carbon neutral services right away? Or if you can't do it, which is fair enough, um, we will then cross charge you the amount and do it for you as a service. That actually could be a business model in its own in its own right. But believe me, we're taking it very very seriously. Okay, thank you, Jan. And uh, I think we're to the end. Thank you, everybody, joining us for today's library seminar. As I mentioned, it's very special. It's kind of we are offering in a hybrid mode. And uh, hope you have a good day and a good afternoon. Thank you, Jan, again. Thank, thank you very much. You.